Hey, Warwick. Hey, Nicole. I'm so excited. Every episode, it's it's a mystery. It's one of those wonderful things about my life. I never know what you're going to come up with. But you do know that I will be researching my joke right up until the last second before we press record. You know that much, so you know and it's, it's coming. And it's research in inverted commas, listeners. <laughs> the YouTubers can see me do the air quotes. I worked very hard on this one. Are you ready? Righto. Hit me. Did I ever tell you that I wanted to be a doctor? No, you did not tell me that, Nicole. No, I just didn't have the patience. Welcome to the Tradies in Business podcast with your hosts, Warwick Bidwell and Nicole Cox. Divert your phone and grab a brew as Waz and Nick unpack tips, tales, secrets and stuff-ups from guests both inside and outside your trade, helping educate and inspire you to break the cycle of gut-busting and money stress and create a true trade business. Um, tish. We even got a strangled chortle out of our <laughs> guest who's supposed to be sitting here waiting quietly. We've, we've worded her up. It's like, we're going to do our funny thing while you just sit here on Zoom. I mean, I'm a bit of an idiot because there's a thing called a mute button. So I could always mute the guest so we don't get the strangled laugh or the groan comes through occasionally. I'd like but, the groan. Uh, that, that, was pretty good, that was pretty good. It was a pity laugh. A pity laugh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I told you I was helping you out with your husband here, and now you've come in with the sledge. We haven't even <laughs> all, right, all right. You're all right. But listeners, I did just find out that she literally Googles the, the joke seconds before. 100%. We're going to have to edit that out, Amy, because <laughs> now, now all of our listeners won't be quite so you know, supportive of Coxie and hating on me for not thinking that Nick's jokes are hilariously funny. You just remind them of all of their own brothers that are forever paying out on their sisters and they they listen to you not laughing at me properly and they think, oh, he's at it again. And sisters are just smart because they do it away from the public eye Mm -hmm. and get away with it. (laughs) Anyway, let's welcome our guest, Amy Stanton. Welcome to the Tradies in Business podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Stoked to be here. Pleasure. Yeah, Looking very forward to our chat. Company. Yeah. Now, I'm going to admit to living under a bit of a rock. I don't watch television. I don't follow much on social media at all, unless it's to do with mountain bikes and wearing micro bikes in the hills. Uh, much to Coxie's disgust. Yeah, I'm just thinking now everybody's laughing for a different reason. Oh, I've been laughed at my entire life and I've turned it into a profession, Coxie. Yeah, yes. So... Amy, please tell our listeners, in case there's anybody as ignorant as me out there listening to the show, um, please tell them who you are, a bit about, you know, how you've turned out to be this famous on the Tradies in Business podcast. I mean, this is like the pinnacle of fame. (laughs) I I, I wouldn't say that. I would say say it maybe a Z-grade celebrity. But, yeah, (laughs) whatever's going, (laughs) I've been on a couple of reality TV shows. I was on Survivor first. Horrible at it, couldn't lie. <laughs> Do very well. So I got booted from that and decided maybe I'll go on something I'm good at. I'm good at renovating. So then went over to house rules and um did pretty well at that. And here we are. Nice. You did it very well, didn't you? Now I was reading this before we jumped on today. And I'm going back to read it and I could just say to you, where did you came second? There you are, I found it. Second. That's pretty impressive. That's not easy to do. Yeah, but by a point. So we'll spoon but where look, everyone's a winner. Everyone gets their house renovated. Yeah. As you can see, we live in such a beautiful house now. So amazing. Yeah. Super blessed and super stoked with how how it turned out. Nice. I think it's really interesting, Amy, because as a builder, we don't watch any renovation shows because it just are we gonna make this an explicit episode? I feel like we should. We're about to. Okay, it just pisses off the builder when he's watching renovation shows. He gets so cranky and it's a communal thing I find with most tradies. They really don't like the renovation shows. And you've not only embraced it, you've done it. You've actually gone and been a contestant on one of these renovation shows. So tell me about that process, do you get any pushback when you talk about it? Did you have to confront your own uncomfortableness around doing it or was it just, not? Nah, I'm in this? It was, look, I like giving everything a crack and it's like you do an adventure, you smash it out, then you move on. So this was something like that, that and when I kind of said to Kane, I'm like, oh, let's do this show, he's like, oh, okay. Like he was a bit shy at the start but then he's just 
loved it and loved being on camera. Um, but <laughs> regarding the building side of things, I didn't know what to expect. They said, we renovate the house in a week, everything done a week. And I'm like, surely not, like, surely not. And then, um, yeah, it's a week. It's a week of no sleep though, but, it, you know, we're talking 60, 70 tradies on site, smashing it out. Everything gets done properly, of course, but there's the aspect of get it done. I wouldn't look too closely at my paint job. In the- <laughs> <laughs> Don't check but, the corners. Um, you know, you give and take and there it is just the most hectic job site you'll ever be on. But having everyone there, the crew and smashing it out, you're like, yeah, this is this is cool. It's a good environment to be in. But most of the time, I, I didn't actually pick up the tools that much because most of the time I'm off shopping and Kane's on site, you know, being the foreman, which is really good because he's had so much experience in that. And yeah, I was just out working my magic with the cushions and stuff. <laughs> Very new to me. God. Working your magic with the cushions. I love it. <laughs> Look, it's a secret power work. I know. Well, I've, I, the, the cushion count, well, the pillow count, I don't know which one it is, cushions on our bed is increasing every year. My wife's like, oh, this one's nice. And then to make the bed, it's like you got to restack all these freaking cushions in the right order. And nah. I just leave that to her. That's why okay. I don't make the bed. It's too much stress. Oh, yeah. it, it is a lot of stress. We have a lot of cushions on ours. Kane, though, he likes to turn into a joke. Like, I'll come home and he, I think the last one he did, he called it the waterfall and he stacked the cushions up and had the throw <laughs> going down. Like, it, it's always something new if Kane makes a bed. The cushions are all over the joint. <laughs> <laughs> now, I really can't imagine a job site where there's more than half a dozen tradies on the site at once, much less like 50, 60 people on site. Does it create arguments the way I imagine it must? Oh, it definitely does create arguments. But I suppose from my perspective, me and Kane, we're so easygoing and we're just like, yeah, you know, you give some, you take some. But, yeah, there's there's stacks of arguments about what section's yours, whose tradies are who, but the key is relationships. I know with us it's and in life as well, on the job site in real life, I yeah. found it's building good quality relationships with your co-workers, with your bosses, and just, you know, having a laugh and actually relating to them and talking about things that you're both interested in and building a friendship because that is the major thing when it comes to, oh, mate, can you come do this? We'll give you a slab and, you know, and then they'll come do it. <laughs> 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 that old chestnut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Paying 100%. It, paying I mean, slab. You're not just a reality TV star, you're a plumber. Yes. And that's only the beginning of the journey, but let's focus on this one for a little bit. Tell us about your plumbing journey. Yeah, so when I was young, I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I actually started studying beauty therapy. Was horrible at it, couldn't paint nails. (laughs) But you can can arrange cushions though. I can now, from Google, now I can arrange cushions. But I was... I was just hopeless. I got expelled and I just didn't know what to do. And then, you know, and then I was like, oh, I can work with my hands. And I remember someone said to me, oh, you, you couldn't be a tradie. Women can't be tradies. And I'm very stubborn guys. And I'm like, yes, they can. And from there I went and decided, which I only figured out the other day why I went down the road of plumbing. It wasn't because I liked dealing with poo. It was because my dad, we used to go camping together and he, took me to the servo after we'd go camping to get an ice cream. And I remember this one time he I reached for, you know, the Magnum, so really expensive ice cream. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, Amy, that's a plumber's ice cream. Only plumbers can afford Magnum. <laughs> and house, we eat frosty fruits. And so from that day on, I'm like, what's this? Well, you know, maybe if I become a plumber, I can eat all the Magnums in the world and my life will be amazing. <laughs> So I applied for 120 jobs, Whoa. become a plumber, and I heard back from one. Wow. And I always thought, which I'm sure it was a bit, this is, we're talking 10 years ago, guys. It was like, oh, because I was a woman, I'd done my pre-apprenticeship and everything. But recently I looked back on my resume and realised there was a hell of a lot of spelling mistakes. <laughs> 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 I 
a bit of a why. And then, yeah, I had a pretty crazy first week on the job site. Um, you know, I got, I got my head stuck in a scaffold. I crashed my car through the job site fence. Oh. And you know, men on site are like women drivers. I'm like, oh man. And not really doing any favors for, it was not for the to... gender um, equalization thing. <laughs> Definitely not. And then I got a, met- a piece of metal stuck in my butt. This is like the first week and I'm not like this is all serious. <laughs> oh, Off to a flying start. On the Friday, I fell through the roof of this. We're working at this tip. I was roof plumbing. I landed on this bloke eating a sandwich and I thought <laughs> yeah, I should have stuck to beauty therapy, but I made it through. I didn't actually get the ass from that job either. So um, we're here and <laughs> learn, you grow and we're here. <laughs> what an incredible first week of work. I don't, I don't even know how you managed to show up the following week. Oh, it was, look, it, it was very embarrassing, mm. but um. I just kept saying to myself, I'm still learning. I know Mm -hmm. nothing about this. I've got four years and every other year on from there to learn about this. How am I, like, I'm obviously very clumsy, but, (laughs) but yeah, I was still learning. I first time on the job site and yeah, you learn and you go and you move on, you get over it. Yeah. Amy, the the business that you started out with, um, obviously, I think it's it's a risk taking on any apprentice or someone who's new to the game, and that that applies even outside the trades. It's not specific to the trades. Um, do, did they like? Was their attitude towards you and your apprenticeship positive, or was it just a uh, you know some businesses are just doing it to get the funding and a labourer? Like, what what was the relationship like? Because you talked about relationships before. Um, between you and your first employer? Yeah, the relationship was actually really good. I only actually stayed with that mob for the first year of my apprenticeship because I wanted to learn more. I was just doing roof plumbing. And, you know, I think, as you said, it's about building those relationships and getting out there. And I know a lot of women come to me these days and go, oh, there's obviously quotas on the job site to be a woman they're like oh I don't want to be a quota I'm like no you be a quota and you be the de- best damn quota you can be and show them you know I'm here I'm giving 110 percent and that's all that really matters mm. Mm. yeah there's an opportunity there and you know you could either take it or or denigrate it and and uh write it off as oh well they're only giving me this because they have yeah. to it's like well yeah you take it or not, you can still make it, like you say, into something yeah. awesome. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Love it. Amy, tell us about, so that's evolved then into doing something with your brother, Ben. Um, tell us about, oh, oh, it's not just tiny houses, it's off-grid tiny houses, which is super impressive. Tell us about what that what you've created there with your brother. Yeah, so I always said I was going to get an apprenticeship under my belt, then go out and chase my dreams then if all else fails, I can kind of do the walk of shame back into my old employer and be like, hey. (laughs) hey." (laughs) So I was doing mechanical plumbing for a big commercial mob. After I finished my apprenticeship, kind of stopped doing that and decided I was going to live for, you know, the, the adventures in life and not the materialistic things. After my apprenticeship, I got really caught up on, eating the magnums every day. I had, I had a a house, like this was at 21 when I turned qualified. I had a house with a mortgage and I had a brand new car with a brand new beautiful car loan. And from the outside, it looked like I had it all. Mm. This amazing commercial plumbing job, this car, I even had a pet pig named Constable Crackles. And I just, <laughs> I just woke up one morning. I'm like, no, there, there's more. There is more to life. I want to see what I can do, how far I can expand myself. Mm. And so I quit my job. I um, I sold everything. I gave my pet pig away to a guy I used to work with. He has a farm, not that type of farm. <laughs> <laughs> the kid where your dog goes, but um, a farm. And, yeah, from that point in time, I did this big walk from Melbourne to Canberra. And that's the moment that really changed my life of, okay, I'm going to create something 
with my passions and turn it into my purpose. So every day I'm waking up and absolutely love getting up, up. And after about two, three years of traveling, my brother, he was an accountant and fell into the same thing as me of like, no, nah, this isn't for me. I want to live a life of adventure and passion and ambition. So we went traveling for a bit together as well and came back and we just started writing down what we were good at and hmm. our passions. And it was, you know, building, we had management skills, Ben had an accountant skills and it was about off grid. And the main thing was getting people from work to go to an off grid place with their loved ones, spend time, take their annual leave and just really immerse themselves in nature. So that's when we came up with the concept of tiny stays. Our dad's a builder, so he helped us build our first tiny house. They're completely off grid. So we have gas bottles connected to the hottie and the stove. We have solar panels. We have a water tank. And how that works is we rent land off farmers and people with lots of land that don't do much of it. They're on a trailer. We build them on site at my parents' house, chuck them on the back of the ute, rock up. There's a bit more to it. <laughs> and um, Bob's your uncle and it's ready for guests and just seeing the look of people's faces when they come adventure and spend that time with their loved ones and get off their emails and away from work it really touches me and it makes me so excited. So now we have seven tiny houses wow. and um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a journey of ups and downs, especially with the off grid side of it. But mm. yeah, like any business, it's an adventure. Mm. So you still, are you still doing that with Ben now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fantastic. So, and is the aim to continue to expand and do, more of those that you can place all around the place or what are you hoping to do with that business? Yeah, well, we've just kind of finished building our seventh one mm -hmm. and I think the goal is for the next probably year is work on getting them booked out seven nights a week and then look at buying our own land mm -hmm. and putting more on there instead of going down the rent way again. Mm -hmm. But the main thing with Tiny Stays for me is that it was a very slow and steady game. Like we started that business in 2017 and we both do other things. So Ben's a firefighter now and I do a lot of other stuff yeah. and it's just constantly building that business and it's not like let's go hard and just smash it out. It's about learning, mucking up, failing, learning again and constantly building it. Then one day it just goes, Drew, and you're like, oh, where, where'd that happen from? You're like, oh, yeah, mm. I've been working hard on it for the last four or five years. I get it. <laughs> mm. No such thing as an overnight I think it's a, Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a big misconception that people have about business. You know, a lot of, a lot of people start their own business and probably have, like I did, these grand ideas like, man, this is just, just going to like be like winning lotto in a couple of years' time and I'll just start a business and still sell stuff and – all of a sudden I'll have the, you know, the Dodge Ram and the big boat and uh, yeah, the flash house. But the reality is very, very different to that. And uh, as you probably know, you know, Nick and I are business coaches and we work with a lot of tradie business owners who have figured out the hard way that, oh, crap, you know, it's not just uh, do a bit of stuff and in a few years I'm making heaps of money. It's a slog. Um, and sometimes you can actually make it big, like you're talking about, Amy, uh, if you put in the, the groundwork. Yeah. Uh, I want to go back to um, something you mentioned, which is a walk that you did. We sort of brushed over that. And I'm fascinated to find out about what's behind the motivation to do something like that. You walked, um, what did you say, Sydney to Melbourne? Melbourne to Canberra. Or? Melbourne to Canberra. Okay. Uh, what possessed you to decide to do that? Um, so that was after I kind of woke up and I thought there's more to life. Why can't I live a life of adventure? And I was actually at the pub one night and someone randomly said to me, oh, you couldn't walk from Melbourne to Canberra. <laughs> Canberra? And like the apprenticeship thing, I'm like, yes, I can. And 
literally, I think it was the next day or two days later, I packed my bag and I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm going to give it a crack. What's going to go wrong? And I remember walking down my driveway, you know, the backpack, because I was just kind of sleeping in my tent on the side of the road. And I remember my parents looking very worried, very <laughs> worried about me. And I looked them in the eyes and I said, mum, dad, at least I'm not on drugs. I'm just going <laughs> for a walk. <laughs> Seems and like then, Forrest Gump. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, about five minutes in, I was like, why did I do this? And then <laughs> but I smartly posted it on Facebook saying I'm walking to Canberra. So I had to. And um, on that adventure, I just, it really made me realize that if it's a walk from Melbourne to Canberra, if it's going adventuring by yourself, if it's starting up a business, you just have to do it. What, what is the worst that's going to go wrong? And I had so much go wrong. Like I had my bag stolen. I walked four days in my thongs because I had nothing, you know, and all this crazy stuff. I got lost in a forest with two cans of tuna. But for some reason, I just... I love the juice of life and I love the roller coaster of the negatives and positives and just enjoying the ride. And I do stuff like that. You know, I try and do stuff like that every couple of years now, just to be like, Oh, Amy, you haven't stepped out of your comfort zone in a while. You better go do something stupid. So at the start of the year, I rode my push bike from Melbourne to Adelaide without being on it for like 10 years. Because you can't train for these things, guys. You just need to get on it and do it. And it's just, you know, everyone says, oh, are you doing it for charity? It's like, no, man, I'm just doing it to have some fun. That's what yeah. life is about. And, um, yeah, so it really changed my perspective of how I do business. It's mm -hmm. all about fun and enjoying that ride of if something bad happens, all right, how can we fix it? I don't get angry or upset most of the time like sometimes I do I'm only human but it's like yes a challenge mm. let's enjoy this roller coaster of emotions and get to the end and make it better for the future does anything scare you Amy <laughs> um skydiving and also little mouse like mice <laughs> well, there was one in the bedroom the other day and I freaked out but I, I, <laughs> you just kill it with a cushion yeah, happy to sleep on the side of a road and <laughs> all that stuff. But uh, yeah, it just gets my adrenaline pumping, things mm -hmm. like that. Where do you think that that comes from for you, Amy? That uh, I wouldn't say lack of fear. Yours is obviously yeah. in, in specific areas. But you know, most people listening to that think about sleeping on the side of the road. Because how long did it take you to walk from Melbourne to Canberra? It took me a month. So I did a few detours and walks and things like that and sometimes my parents would meet me at a bnb &B on a weekend and i'd stay with them and then wish them goodbye <laughs> keep walking mm. but it's more that thing of if i don't do this now i know and i always as cliche it sounds i always think about and actually look at people that are 60 70 80 and I wish I should have done that. I wish I should have done that. Mm. And like my parents are amazing and very driven and they have, my dad's a builder. He has his own business and mum runs B&Bs. My mum's kind of scared of going on like a kid's roller coaster. So the fear thing probably isn't from her. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't actually know. I think it was just the thing that scared me was not having this one life and doing it in an adventurous way and trying random things. That's what scares me the most. Mm, that's a good point. Hey, tradies in business, was here. Sorry to interrupt your listening pleasure. I'm joined by Coxie, of course. <laughs> Hello. You may not know this, tradie or tradie wife, or whoever you are listening to this program, but we're business coaches. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, that feels I weird know. to say. <laughs> <laughs> but we do actually work with people just like you to solve a bunch of problems. And we have this fantastic program called the Tradiepreneur Program, and that's how we do it. And we do it with a wonderful community of trade business owners who are all trying to fix or improve or change things to progress. Things like... Getting behind on quoting, Coxie. 
feeling overwhelmed, behind on your invoicing, feeling really stressed or frustrated about the money stuff. Sometimes you can pay the bills, sometimes you can't. What about staff? Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh, staff. Trying to get them to do what you want them to do, if you can even find them in the first place. Uh, There's so many struggles. And we've seen clients tackle these things in their trade businesses in a quite a short space of time, to be honest, Mm -hmm. during the program and recruit staff at a time where everybody was saying you can't get good staff, Mm -hmm. improve their quality from their team, collect their debts much more quickly. We have sessions. Tips. Yes. Getting tips. Yes. So uh, people rounding up, customers rounding up the invoice by hundreds of dollars Mm -hmm. because they're so happy with the sales process and the experience of dealing with the trade business owner and their team. So some amazing stories from our clients. But, you know, as they say in the the commercials, don't take it from us. Uh, (laughs) Hear what some of our clients have to say. Coming into Christmas, we are not worried about money. We've got enough money in the bank to pay everybody's leave. There's work booked in for the new year. And for the first time in a long time, we'll be having three weeks off and not worrying about the business. That's probably the biggest win of all. Using the cash flow forecast, I've been able to look into the future and see where I'm going to be situated financially. And it's actually started to have a huge bearing on whether or not I make purchases. By far, one of the best things about working with Nick and Woz are the other businesses that are working alongside them. It is amazing how empowering it is to be working alongside like-minded people who have similar goals, similar troubles. We can all relate to each other and everybody helps everybody out by figuring out problems with you that they may have faced previously. Everybody has solutions and constructive feedback. And it's an incredibly friendly, warm, welcoming environment, not threatening at all. From every job, I know that I will get a sustainable wage that's industry leading. I can have at least 10 to 20% profit and I can pay taxes, super, all of that. And I do not have to question whether or not I can because of the way that it's been built. And that is thanks to traders in business and what they've taught me and what I've learned. So there you go. There's some real people. We did not pay them to say those things. <laughs> and I think that sounds a lot better than Coxie and I reading them out. We really would love for you to check out more about how you could take your trade business to where you would like it to be. Surely you have a vision of what things could be like or what you wish they were like on a day-to-day basis, Mm -hmm. Um, whether that is reducing stress or actually making more money. Maybe it's spending more time with the family, taking more holidays, having the choice Mm. that you really wanted when you started your business instead of this beast that seems to be there for many of you listening to this program. So if you want to find out more about how we do this through the Tradiepreneur program, Coxie's going to tell you all about it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm actually not. I'm going to be really secretive and uh, keep all of our magic up our sleeves. What I would like you to do, though, is head on over to tradiesandbusiness.com.au. You can learn all about us, why we do what we do, and how you can work with us, what that actually looks like. There's a whole bunch of free stuff there for you to download, uh, lots of options. We've always got new stuff going up onto the website and a great place for you to learn a whole bunch more about how you can work with us. You can even book a 15-minute chat. For free. For free. That's how abundant we are. So head over to the website, uh, check it out, book a chat with us, and we'd love to find out if you'd be a great fit for the Tradiepreneur community and start hanging out with some of those people that you just heard from. (laughs) So uh, what's next on the cards uh, adventure-wise? You're doing tiny stays. Uh, Have you got any more, you know, television appearances coming up or any (laughs) plans to start more businesses with family members? What's on the cards for you, Amy? Yes, I've just started. We're launching in July our women's workwear brand in, you know, when I I, I was a trader and still now because I'm still on the tools with Tiny Stays a lot, at least two, three times a week. And none of the clothes fitted me. And I was like, there's definitely a gap in the market from this. I spoke to all other women in construction. They're like, no, nah, even the women's clothes, they're like, some of them are men's clothes and they'll just put pink stitching on it and call it <laughs> women's. Yep. So I was like, well, I, if no one's going to listen to me, I'll just do it myself. And I remember I sent my fashion designer these cartoon pictures. He's like, 
you're going to need a lot of help with this, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, it's, it's been two years of research and in the making and we're finally launching in stores in July. And I'm just so proud of how good the clothes are. And the main thing for me is seeing women on the job site being comfortable and confident because I put up with it for so long and I see people now put up with it for so long. Yeah, you know, you might be on a job site with a hundred guys and you're the only girl, but at least if you can feel comfortable, mm. which makes you fit in, then um, you're halfway there. So mm. that's exciting. Never thought I'd go down the road of fashion design, but here we are. <laughs> that adventurous life, isn't it? <laughs> that, that's it. That's it. Amy, what's been the the I guess the hardest bit of this newest interpretation of your adventurous life um that's obviously a big transition from what you're currently doing to even the language that's used in the fashion industry is so different to what we use in tradey world what are some of those things that you really uh found challenging yeah definitely i think one of the main ones was you know for instance with tiny stays as i said it was a slow burn we have I think we start off with 10 grand each, me and Ben. We're like 10 grand each, put it into the business and slowly build it. With Zadie, it's like, here's my whole entire life savings. Here's my investment property. Here's my left butt cheek. Like, <laughs> create me some clothes. Let's go hard and try and build this into an empire. And I think the thing dealing with, you know, not on the job side, I'm the worst at in emails and stuff I'm so like hey legend what's going on queen and, <laughs> and um yeah people are a little bit more serious they're like who's this goose <laughs> um, but within saying that you're bringing a different perspective into their life like oh yeah, this yeah. you know maybe we can learn something and mm. yeah and I think one of the hardest things for me was oh, oh yeah all the office work and kind of sitting sitting in an office all the time my my um business partner is up in Queensland actually and you know I go there and I sit down and I'm like how do you guys do this for eight hours I'll be like standing on the wall or standing here and from that I've learned one of the biggest tactics I've taken on is literally every hour just get up for five minutes and go for a walk watch a bird and it's actually changed my life I'm like this is makes me so much more focused put the alarm on for an hour smash out my work go for a walk and come back to the the desk I mean was it I'm making lots of assumptions in my head maybe can you compare your journey into plumbing so as a, a woman coming into the construction industry that journey as compared to a plumber, still a woman, a plumber um, becoming a fashion designer and creating a fashion label. I imagine they both had really unique struggles, but maybe there's a lot of commonality between the two as well. Yeah, I think definitely when I obviously entered the industry that I was that one girl in the pink socks with the pink lunchbox on site but always giving 110 percent and showing my passion and enthusiasm and I suppose that has resonated and carried over to the fashion designer thing I know my manufacturers my designers everyone like that they know I I have no idea and I'm learning mm -hmm. and being real about I'm new to this guys I'm trying the best I can which is exactly the same as a plumbing apprenticeship mm -hmm. Be kind to me. And so that's definitely been one of the easier things to transfer over, but probably coming into it and, you know, having, being a plumber, you're worried about things, but as long as you have the right team by your side and you try your hardest and give 110% and admit when you muck up, like I muck up all the time in, you know, every day I'm mucking up and it just makes me more excited mm. to keep going. And my main thing is to be real with the people I work with so they know it's a journey for everyone. 
I've worked with a lot of apprentices and I find that many of them um, carry a, a deep sense of shame around, you know, when they don't know, they're not meant to know, I agree with you 100%, and they find it hard to ask for help or they find it hard to, you know, confront that they've made a mistake. And you, to me, seem like that's something that you embrace really strongly. It's, you, you have very different method I feel than many of the apprentices that I've certainly worked with and that's transpired over into what you're doing with the workwear label as well is that something that you've always had Amy or is it something that you your parents taught you or where has that come from I think it's probably coming come from failing so much and um, being so difficult that first week on the job site really made me have tough skin And I know as an apprentice, it's so hard to ask for help or get someone to explain something to you. But I honestly found it harder, which I really struggled with, was after my apprenticeship asking for help. Mm. And that was because in my apprenticeship, I'm like, yeah, how do I do this? Because it's like, oh, she's just an apprentice, you know, and she wants to learn. But the moment you're out of fourth year, it's like, you should know everything. You should know everything about everything. And that was the hard bit for me of like, oh, crap, I'm qualified now. And I had this perspective in my head, I've got to know it all. Mm. And I think that only really changed. And that it was still like that up to when I, when I did leave and, and do the walk to Canberra. But then after that, I was like, everyone's learning. And I think the other thing is you realise you always, when you're younger, used to look at adults yes. and they had it all together. Now I look at adult, well, I'm an adult now, but, you know, I look at adults and your family and your parents, friends and stuff. It's like no one has any idea what they're doing. In this life. <laughs> no idea at all. Just as long as you're enjoying it, having fun and growing every single day and learning, then that's not a bad life, I don't think. Yeah, I think we're all making the shit up as we go. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, know better than anyone. <laughs> absolutely, nobody's got a clue. We there is no handbook on life. There's plenty of um, self help books. Yeah. Where do they come from? People that have failed and had to find mm. a way through the failure, right? Yeah. So we're all making it up as we go. It, it's very normal. I mean, um, Zadie, tell us about what that looks like in terms of launch. Um, how do you find stores to stock your workwear? W- what's this end? Well, it's not the end part, but this next part of that journey look like for you? Yeah, definitely. So I kind of at the start was thinking of going down the road of purely like everyone does, sell off my website from my back dodgy shipping container and then try to get some retailers on board. Having a business mentor and you would know better than anyone as well how valuable that is and how great it is. So for me, having a business mentor, I realised I've got to choose one way to go about this, purely be a wholesaler Mm -hmm. and stock to retailers or purely go hard online. And I kind of looked at the market and I thought, okay, what's everyone doing? I'll do the opposite. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everyone was stocking online and, yes, getting in some workwear stores, but... Now my main thing with Zadie, apart from the end consumer, is I want to give my all to the retailers and show them I'm not selling direct to consumer. You guys are my best friend. I want to make this work. I want to make this smooth for you as possible. And that's kind of the business model we're going down now. And so when I go, you know what it's like when you're trying to sell your product, you make, you make, and what do they call it? An irresistible offer. So they can't say no. When a girl who's in the trades, who spends time with women in construction every single day, who's saying, I'm not selling direct consumer. You're going to be the one in the area that I come to this and that it's hard to say no to such a good offer. And all you can do is give it a crack. And I think me having that, being a woman in trade did help a lot with that as well because I know exactly what we want because I'm the target market. Mm. And Yeah, so we're going to kind of start stocking in about 20 retailers across Australia. Just the other main thing is not biting off more than we can chew because 
I don't want to come to a stage, which it would be nice if you did. It's like, I've got no stock for you guys. I'm so sorry. It's like yeah. we sell 50% of our stock and then keep the other 50% so it can slowly. It's all about getting that customer and just appreciating them and giving them the best value you can. And I think if every single person follows that business model, it is hard to fa- fail as long as you're just looking at your end consumer and what they want and what they're asking for. Mm. What sort of pieces will you have available, Amy, in, at least in this first instance? We have, I found the biggest problem with other workwear was the, sh- the bottoms because, you know, women have hips and thighs and butts and, yes, we do. and most of the time are pretty pretty straight. Yep. Um, and so it's going to be shorts, pants, overalls, and then kind of build the range from there. But I'm just focusing on what the industry needs at the moment and then mm-hmm. building from there. Mm. It's fantastic. Have you had uh, some market feedback? So have you sent out some samples to some of your tradie lady mates and gotten some feedback from them around what works and what doesn't work and then built off the back of that? Yes, definitely. It's literally been a, a two-year process. The first thing I did was actually send, uh, like do a survey. And I just think this is such a good idea for any market research giveaway. I gave away because my target audience was tradies, a $100 minor 10 voucher and said, fill out this survey. And I had more than 2,000 women in the trades complete it and it asked them every single question on basically what do you want, what material do you want, how do you want it, cuff, no cuff, this, that, sizes. And so I had all my market research in one spot and then once I got the products, it's constantly trying them on different size tens, for instance, because there's tall, slim, there's, you know, slightly larger, shorter, and it's really hard as women to... Yeah. One size fits all, and I'm sure you can't you can't please everyone in in business and and in life. But you can try the hardest you can to please the majority of people. So it's been constantly back and forth from the manufacturer, making sure the product is a hundred percent perfect. And I know people say just perfect doesn't matter. Get it out there. But when you are spending your life savings on this first mm-hmm. load of things you want you want to make sure it's it's pretty good yeah. <laughs> you really do you want a good user experience yeah. <laughs> yeah amy you mentioned having a business mentor and i can't let that go as a as a coach of course i want to make a point of this for our listeners <laughs> how did you find them um you know did did you st- did you decide that you wanted one or was it an accidental uh, relationship that's happened? I'm all, from the girl who got expelled from school and now the girl who just loves and embraces learning every single day and online courses and reading and this and that. I think I started, I started going to conferences and um, seeing the value in having someone there. You can even talk, talk about things and get a different perspective because you know your mom and your husband are going to go yeah that's great sweetie yeah that looks good (laughs) but in the hard truth you need someone there to say get your stuff together this no that's not going to work you need to do this and it holds you accountable Mm -hmm. one of the main things is getting held accountable for what you do and the biggest thing if you invest because if you invest in a mentor or, you know, whatever it is, you're going to be like, I have to do this now. I'm going to smash it out because I've invested my money into this. That's mm-hmm. right. And just having someone there to talk to and have a different perspective on everything has just changed my life. So I'm always constantly looking and I always say to myself, oh, when, you know, when I'm making absolutely huge dollars i'm just thinking about all the tens of thousands of dollars of courses i've got to go through to. <laughs> return on investment yeah because that's it that's it so it's definitely something i i couldn't i couldn't live without and if that's just early days i was just t- typing in google finding you know either just 
getting a feel for what a mentor would be like and kind of looking into it. I started off just trying. I think there was free government ones. I always take up those offers for everything, even if you can get one piece of advice out of it. Um, I'm always on the hunt for just getting people's perspectives on it. Yeah. Love it. Love it. I love how open you are to, uh, I guess, outside information. You know, everything you've talked about so far is you're just willing to give things a go. You're open-minded. Uh, you know, you, you strike me as someone who doesn't need to know everything before you take action, which seems to be such a big blockage for people in business. You know, that those of you listening to this episode, many of you are in business or some of you are thinking about starting a business. I think, Amy, you really embody that whole just have a crack Obviously, you do a bit of preparation. You know, if you're going to put your life savings into something, you don't want to just throw it away on on number seven at Randwick. But, uh, you know, you still have to have a crack at some point. Do you find for you there's a there's a tipping point for when you will jump in and do something? Like what's what's that look like for you? Do you have a research period or is it just everything is just like, I'll go do it and I'll make it up as I go? It's normally like I think the, the workwear thing as per usual – you think of in the shower and <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, and then from there you kind of get the research you, like you do a well I think I do a one page business plan that is written on paper and pen get the research and then kind of think to myself no this is going to work and it's not till months and months of kind of figuring out what you're going to do, you put your life savings into it. Yeah, yeah. But even then, I don't, like, I don't know what's going to happen. I, That's right. I, one thing I do know is that I'm not going to fail. Yes, I might, it might, you, you never know what's going to happen, but if all goes down the drain, it's like, all right, what's another way I can adapt? Mm. <laughs> all right, I'm living on the streets. How can I get off the streets, back into the office and, and kind of work with the prototype. It's never giving up. It's just, as I said before, enjoying the ride of the emotions and just going in. And I think one of the good things for that, as well as a mentor, is having a business partner that's kind of good in other skills to you. I know with me and my brother, I know I, he's very, ha, has to be researched 100 million percent. He does all his research and <laughs> accountant and I'm the, even though with the work where it's like these have to be a hundred percent but I am like get it done put your passion into it spell check it put it out there <laughs> so we work really well together because you know if it was just Ben the business might not have even started yet yeah. <laughs> and if it was just me it might have started but it might have been like a real dodgy, yeah. a, a real dodgy tidy house. Yeah. I didn't do enough research on solar or something like that. So find someone that have the same values and work ethics in life, but have different skills and work together with them because you can always build something bigger as a team than just yourself. Fantastic. Amy, there's a question I love to ask most of our guests on the show, and uh, I'm keen to hear from you on this one. If you had a thousand tradies in a room, and maybe you've done this already, um, you've been on TV, so I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, <laughs> but if you had a thousand tradies in a room, what's one piece of advice you would love to leave them with? Oh, wow. Okay. I think it would be make sure you're getting up every day and having fun go to work always find the fun in whatever you do or else you know you see I've seen it a million times I see people on the job site so upset and with life and walking around like this and on their phones and swiping tinder in the toilet and waiting for that weekend and it's like if you just found a little bit of fun to put into every task you're doing it's going to be so much more enjoyable, you know, put your shoulders back, actually lift your energy and it would be amazing how much better your day gets than just like, oh, yeah, okay, oh, whatever, whatever. <laughs> when, is it Friday? when is it Friday? So, yeah, probably that. <laughs> just described half my relatives. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's great advice, Amy, and um, certainly, you know, looking at, at uh, what, stories you've shared we can see that showing up for you so it's fantastic to see the proof in the pudding 
Um, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a fascinating chat. There's so many facets to to you and what you're working on. I'm sure this is just the tip of the iceberg that you've shared with us. So um, I'm sure we're going to see more of you and your workwear brand in the future. Uh, if listeners want to go and check you out online, um, not that way, but you know, from a business sense, <laughs> if they want to stalk you as business people, what's the best place for them to go and find out more about you and what you're up to? Uh, probably on the old Instagram. It's just Amy Kate Stanton or Tiny Stays or Zadie Workwear. But if anyone ever wants to chat about anything, especially women in the trades or apprentices, like reach out to me. I'm always keen to chat and whatever it's about. So, and yeah, but thank you guys so much for having me. You're absolutely killing it. And what you're doing is just amazing for the trade industry. Absolutely doing so well. So keep it up. Thanks, Amy. I love you, Zef- Zest for Life, Amy. Thank you for coming on the show and bringing the energy. Keep no up. worries, guys. Have a good one. You Thanks. Too. You've been listening to the Tradies and Business Podcast with Warwick Bidwell and Nicole Cox. Find out more about today's guest, tools for your trade business and other cool stuff at tradiesandbusiness.com.au.